Last week, uh, we considered 2020, proof of no God. Um, and yeah, we actually have the speaker, Steve Vaughn, who spoke last week and he's back again um, on the panel. He just loved it so much. So um, yeah, I wonder if Steve, um, what if you have any reflections or thoughts on last week and how you find it? Yeah, lovely to be back. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you for those that have come for the first time. Nice to have you here. And for those of you that are returning, then you're obviously gluttons for punishment. So well done for, for putting up with us. I mean, last week, by the way, I had a few thoughts. Firstly, it was a ton of fun. Um, it's not very often that you get a really gracious, robust, honest, but with respect to no one was getting nasty, discussion and debate. And when I think about what intro was, you know, the aims of intro, what are we trying to do? We're trying to create a safe space where people can examine the Christian faith and the Christian answers to the big questions of life whilst pushing and probing in both directions. And I just thought that was, I guess I was so chuffed that that could happen. And thank you to everyone who participated in such a good way. Um, and I thought it was a lot of fun. And I think uh, uh, the feedback we seemed to get was that people appreciated that. Um, so thank you. And I, and <clears throat> I think for me, <clears throat> excuse me, the issue of, you know, <clears throat> the number of the issue for the Christian is, does Jesus provide answers that are both intellectually credible and existentially satisfying? In other words, does, does believing in Jesus mean you have to leave your brain behind? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is, it's just philosophically and scientifically improbable to, to, to conclude that Jesus is who he says he is given in the world we live in. And secondly, you know, does Jesus also meet the the heart needs we have and the meaning needs we have and so i think those two things together is kind of what you know what is the best explanation of the world around us and what is the best way to find to live and to find happiness and satisfaction we're trying to do both together you know so uh, i thought it last week was just super so thanks for coming thanks for your questions thanks for coming back keep them coming and uh looking forward to another evening yeah thanks so much steve yeah so we have one rule here at intro that there's no question too simple and no question too feisty. So please, please, please do send your questions in. Um, and yeah, so this week we're going to be looking at 2020 comfort in COVID. And you know, I know for me that COVID really forced me to think about what I mean by comfort. And I think for me, it was everyday things, you know, being able to go into the library with friends to study or going to the pub for a pint with friends, and just having chats. And all of a sudden, we just couldn't do any of these things that were comfortable ordinary fun things um, and so COVID really shifted that um, and I know for me I was thinking whoa wh where do I find my comfort what does this mean and um, so yeah let's let's get going and um, again it's been super fun so I'm really excited for this week um, and to kick us off here we have Andrew um, giving his testimony tonight and um, yeah so Andrew why don't you just introduce yourself and, and tell us your story Hi guys, um, so my name is Andrew, I'm 28 years old and I just moved down to Dublin last year from Belfast uh, where I grew up. Um, so I didn't grow up in a Christian family and none of my family in Belfast would really regard themselves as Christians or uh, like churchgoers. So my Christian faith still to this day is a bit of a strange topic at home. Uh, with my family like they don't really ask about it i don't really uh, talk about it much and life goes on so i'll have to admit it's a little bit odd but i don't want to ram it down their throats as you all know that can often do more harm than good so i grew up with quite a variety of friends in belfast and um, but it was one of my best friends who was a christian he would go to these uh, youth nights on a Tuesday night uh, um, at our local church. And I always thought Christians were, you know, like weirdos or like, crazy or like losers. Um, but he kept inviting me. Not that he was a loser. Nice guy. Uh, but eventually one afternoon I caved and I decided to go. And it was fun. And there were normal people there. People who just wanted to have the crack, talk about life. Um, have fun but also had a faith in Jesus and I had this min misconception that all churchgoers were like super religious and would force it on you and had no concept of reality um, and yet or, or especially in Northern Ireland with that complete polarization of religion 
And yet here I was going back uh, week on week to chat, to make friendships and uh, learn that being a Christian is more about our relationship with God and less about that toxic religion that I associated it with in Northern Ireland. So I'd grown up to think that you have to earn uh, your place as a Christian to be morally perfect. Like everything else in life, uh, I thought the harder you work, the, the more reward you get, be it career or sport or anything. And so I would think you're either morally perfect with God or completely off the rails. But God doesn't want that. God loves us how we are. And I believe that Jesus died for to forgive me for all the wrongs that I've done. Um, Jesus died for us when we are unlovely and undeserving. And that's still something I'm trying to get my head around and try to understand. But it was through this youth group that I first uh, you know developed a faith and, and became a Christian. It was sort of towards then the end of school and start of, univer start of university when I started to become quite bitter at the church. Being in my last year of school and first year of university I started to enjoy the odd night out and everything that goes with that and at the time I was a youth leader in my church um, and a couple of friends had mentioned this to the youth pastor and it ended up that me and three of my friends, we got banned from being a youth leader uh, um, from that youth club. Um, and of course, everybody heard about this and with it came that shame and that embarrassment. And it just created this real bitterness in me against the church and something that I didn't want to be involved with or associated with. So I then started to live for myself. I was trying to fit in and I was trying to be cool and do what I wanted. Um, I blamed the church for all the bad things that were happening in my life. Maybe friends I had lost, uh, stepping away from my faith, uh, basically anything negative that would happen, um, I would blame the church. However, as I started to walk away from God, I started to feel this sense of emptiness and unfulfillment. And in my bitterness of blaming others, I was unable to find peace in my day-to-day -day life. And it drained me and constantly drained me as I tried to fit in. So I think the biggest blocker to my faith uh, was the fear of being different. I didn't want to be seen as that weird guy, which I uh, uh, one time viewed Christians as in Belfast. Living for myself meant fitting in, being uh, uh, selfish, ignoring God and going out and doing what I wanted. So it came to a point a few years later when I was doing a summer camp in Canada, when I realized a lot of the emptiness and unfulfillment. And then the only steady thing I realized, an underlying consistent thing in my life was my faith and was God. Um, and I had to realize that he loved me no matter what. He accepted me, whether I fitted in or not. Um, and it took a lot of realization over the summer to understand that a life with God is so much more fulfilling than living for myself. Now I'm working in Dublin. Um, I'm working with the UN in Dublin um, and I work with some really, really vulnerable people, people who have gone through incredibly difficult and awful situations in their life. And, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, I would hear some of the worst things that one human can do to another which can be really tough at times. And it does re raise a lot of questions for me, like simple questions like, why do bad things happen? Or uh, why do good people hurt? And to be honest, I still really struggle with this. Um, and I haven't answered all of them um, by any means, but getting rid of God doesn't help to make things any better. And without God, the world is just as dark, but there is no comfort or hope. Um, and in the work I do, I believe it is important to hold on to that comfort and hope that God brings. So while people endure difficulties, there's also so much good and so many moments of joy and happiness in this like chaotic year and in the chaos of life that people choose to ignore, whether it's families being reunited 
people being cured of illness or other people, you know, moving and starting new lives elsewhere. So that is uh, where I'm at, kind of. Um, I still struggle with my faith sometimes. I find it difficult to share my faith with people, uh, difficult to share my faith with my family, some of the closest people to me. And I can be, you know, extremely insecure, selfish, and completely full of pride. But at the end of the day, I will always go back to God. And that is where I am at right now. So thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you so, so much, um, Andrew, for sharing. Um, and yeah, I know I, I really appreciated just, um, yeah, the rawness and realness of that. And um, yeah, we all have um, questions and, and challenges. And so, um, yeah, without further ado, I'll introduce um, our speaker for tonight. His name is Andrew Tuddy. Um, and he's currently a master's student um, at UCD studying chemical engineering. And um, so, yeah, over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Andrew, for sharing. Um, that, 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 that was great. And yeah, I think it's going to link really nicely to the talk today. So the first thing I want to, I'm going I'm to give you a few quotes here. Let's start with Elon Musk. The eccentric mind behind innovative companies like Tesla, SpaceX, and PayPal, he claims that there is no better time to be alive than today. And that humanity, he's quoted as saying, can address a lot of the suffering that occurs in the world and make things a lot better. And Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, agrees, citing the fact that 100 years ago, the average person spent about 11 and a half hours each week doing their laundry compared to a mere hour and a half nowadays. He also notes that the global IQ score is rising about three points each decade, thanks to better nutrition and cleaner environments. And he says, the world is getting better, even if it doesn't always feel that way. And then thirdly, we have Kathleen Moran. She's a best-selling Irish author and journalist. And she claims this is still the best time in history to be a woman, despite all the scandals that we read about in the newspapers. But despite all these quotes, suffering still does exist. And it doesn't appear to be ceasing. Although we don't spend all day 11 doing laundry anymore in slavery. That's about four times. Many of these slaves are. And despite Kathleen Moran's quote, currently in New Zealand, a country praised for its handling of the pandemic and seen as progressive and idealistic by many, 20% of women will be physically abused by a male partner in their lifetime. And one in five women will be a victim of rape or attempted rape in their lifetime. Despite this apparently being the best time to be alive, I can still feel the ache of seeing my aunt Rhoda painfully fight a losing battle with cancer for two years before passing a couple of months ago. I can, I can see the grief on the face of my own mother as she tries to return to some sort of norm normality after losing her second sister prematurely. Suffering still exists and suffering is still a problem. The, the COVID pandemic has thrust suffering into the limelight. It, it, it wasn't that it wasn't there before, but now it's highlighted for all to see. Job loss, businesses closing, social isolation, restrictions, growing rates of depression and anxiety, illness and death. These are all the things we hear about every day in the media and all we speak about with friends. Now I wanna do two things in this talk, comfort in COVID 2020. Firstly, I'm going to give some philosophical answers to the question of suffering. As, as Andrew just said in his personal story, questions he still as a Christian suffers with, but questions that we all struggle with. How can there be a good God, given that there is so much suffering in the world right now? Why do bad things happen to good people? And the second thing I want to do is to give some personal answers. How can we find hope and peace in this time of suffering? How can we find comfort 
in COVID. And for both, I want to compare the Christian view to the secular answers that said there is no God. Tonight, we are talking about what is known as theodicy, where the argument against God goes something like this. Since there is so much evil in the world, there cannot be an all-powerful and all-loving God. If he was powerful, he would be able to get rid of suffering. And if he was all-loving, he would want to get rid of suffering. Since evil exists, an all-loving, all-powerful God cannot exist. However, philosophically, the atheist has two problems when posing such a challenge. Firstly, they are assuming a moral law. In saying that there is such thing as evil, you must be then assuming there is such thing as good. Without good, you can't have evil. When you admit to a moral law, you admit to a moral law giver. This, however, is the person you're trying to disprove if you're an atheist. If there is no moral law giver, there is no moral law. If there's no moral law, there's no good or evil. And all this talk of suffering is therefore nonsensical. Your objection is redundant. Now, somebody might say, well, I don't need a moral lawgiver to tell me good or evil. What matters to me is that we alleviate human suffering. And that is how I try to live my life, a bit like Elon Musk. I don't think this really works. I think it, it has problems of its own because secondly, they are assuming human life is valuable. But why is human life valuable if, to quote atheist and Oxford professor Peter Atkins, we are nothing more than slime on a planet? Without God, there is no reason to value life. To use Bert Rand Russell's expression, man is a curious, a curious accident in a backwater. So do you see the distinction between good and evil and the valuing of human life only makes sense if there is a God who gives the distinction and gives the value to human life by making us in his own image. Although suffering may challenge our belief in God, and I think that's fair to say, if you say to me, it wasn't supposed to be this way, that's wrong. Humans were never meant to die of coronavirus. Humans were never meant to die of cancer. These things weren't supposed to happen. But why do you think there should be a world that isn't full of evil and suffering? Have you ever known such a world? Where do you think that idea comes from? Why do you think human life is valuable? If we're just a set of chemicals, that there's no greater reason for our existence except a random big bang that kicks us all into existence against all the odds. And if it's all random, why is human life valuable? We are just a bit of slime on a planet, we are just a curious backwater, a curious accident in a backwater. So here's my point. The very fact that we often look to the heavens and cry out why reveals that somewhere deep inside us, we believe somebody is there. And it feels like they're not listening or they don't care, but they are there. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. If you're really the product of your materialistic universe, how is it that you don't feel at home here? Do the fish complain of the sea for being wet? Now, maybe our reaction to evil and suffering, far being evidence against God, is actually evidence for God. You see, if you get rid of God, well, you get rid of the problem and you just have to get on with it. And maybe you'll do that. But if you, if you trivialize the suffering, your, your question's redundant. So you take away God, take away suffering, you don't, then there is no suffering. So let me push you a little bit further. What is wrong with the world? What's wrong with the world? How do we set about putting things right? Why is the world a mess? Is it a lack of education? Is it a, a lack of technology? Is it a lack of communication? You can't, you can't say that. You see, if you don't believe in a God, and you believe we're all here by random chance and the fittest, fittest of us survive longer and those that are less fit, well, why do we expect a world that is not cruel and harsh and random and unjust? But we know something is wrong. We, we can sense it, we feel it, we think it. Children dying of cancer, AIDS, homelessness, miscarriages, war, terrorism, pedophilia, murder, rape, coronavirus. It's a dark world and we know it, but, but why do we think that? 
We imagine and hope for a world without disease, without COVID, without suffering and without death, but none of us have ever known such a world. None of us have ever experienced that world, yet it remains somewhere deep inside our consciousness that we are meant to live in such a world. As C.S. Lewis helpfully remarked, it's like a fish continually being surprised at the wetness of the water. Where does this sense of something being wrong come from? What are we comparing our world to? What, how can we fix it? So intellectually, I think you have greater problems around the question of suffering if you're an atheist than if you're a Christian. But I think I have a worldview that explains why we have a problem in the first place. And it means that suffering is not trivial. It's not meaningless. And that's my belief in God. And it, it gives me a moral law, direct, def, de, um, yeah, showing me what, what is right and what is wrong, differentiating right from wrong, good from evil. And secondly, it explains why human beings are infinitely valuable and worth caring for. The atheist has no worldview, no explanation that accounts for, for these things, and the problem of suffering falls flat. And by the way, philosophically, if you have a God big enough and powerful enough to be mad at for not stopping evil, you'll also have a God big enough and powerful enough to have a reason for not stopping the evil and suffering. If I show you an empty classroom, for example, and I ask you if there is an elephant in the room, the answer should be pretty clear. But if I show you the same room and I ask you, do you see any COVID-19 virons in there? You cannot tell me yes or no because it's too small for us to see with our eyes. You cannot say, because I can't see any reason for, for God to not stop this evil and suffering, that there cannot be a reason. Who are you, an all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise God? No, if you have a God big enough and powerful enough, to be mad at, you also have a God big enough and wise enough to have reasons for what he's doing. So then we come to the personal answer. How can you find comfort and peace in a time of suffering? How can you find comfort in COVID? Now, COVID-19 is no respecter of persons or national borders, wealth, status. It's like death, it's like suffering. It's a great leveler. And so the question is, how do you find peace given that none of us are immune to suffering? Now, Christianity, as Andrew said earlier, may not have all the knockdown arguments to the problem of suffering, but I want to argue tonight that it is the last one standing. It offers us more resources than any other religion or worldview. And why is that? Because there's one thing that separates Christianity from all other religions and worldviews. It's the one thing that makes it unique. It's the one thing that speaks so relevantly to our suffering. It's the one thing that gives us resources for comfort in suffering. The answer God gives to the problem of evil and suffering is his son on a bloody cross. The Christian message is that our God entered the world of suffering. He took on flesh and bones and he experienced everything we experienced and worse, culminating with his death on a cross. Our God suffered, our God was crucified, our God died. He felt the physical pain as the cat of nine tails impaled on his back and he winced as the nails were hammered through his wrists. He felt the emotional pain of being mocked, laughed at, spat on, humiliated by his accusers, as well as being abandoned by his friends. But worst of all, he felt the relational and spiritual pain of being rejected by his father. And so he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? He could have remained distant and far off, but instead, in his love, he came down to suffer for us. And this has huge implications. Firstly, we can have comfort that we're not alone. You know that in that moment of pain and suffering, as a mother holds her dying baby, as a young boy watches his father lose his fight with cancer, all the books written on suffering, all the eloquent words and quotes spoken, those things couldn't matter less. 
When confronted with the raw reality of suffering and evil, what is needed is someone's presence alongside to help you through. Someone who sympathizes or better, someone who empathizes with you, who knows, who understands your pain and they can comfort you. Have you ever lost a child? So has God. Have you ever been isolated and rejected? So has God. Have you ever suffered loneliness? So has God. Have you wanted to give up? So has God. Have you been treated unfairly? So has God. Have you? So has God. We see in relationships that lovers don't want explanations, but they want presence. Does he descend into all of our hells? Yes, he does. From the depths of a Nazi death camp, Corey Ten Boom, a Holocaust survivor, wrote, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. He is gassed in Auschwitz. He is destroyed in the Indian Ocean tsunami. He is infected and isolated during COVID-19. Every tear we shed becomes his tear. It doesn't make the pain go away. I give you that. It doesn't take away the agony or the hurt or the loss, but it does mean he understands. God knows and God cares and God is with me and I am not alone. In other words, I may not know the answer to why God is allowing this suffering to happen, but I know what the answer isn't. It cannot be that he doesn't love me. The cross shows me that. So firstly, we get comfort, we're not alone. And secondly, we get hope. The future is bright. You see, not only did God enter, the, enter into the worst suffering imaginable on the cross, but three days later, he rose again from the dead and he beat humanity's worst enemy, death. And the resurrection assures me that one day, the broken creation will be completely fixed as God restores things to how they should be. That's that world we want. The New Testament very clearly portrays heaven as a real place. In fact, it would be better to call it the new creation because God will restore this world fully. It's the world we want. It's the world we imagine. It's the world we all think we should live in. The new creation is the place where there are no tears, no pain, no crying, no mourning, no sadness, loneliness, anguish or heartbreak. There's, there's, there's no greed, no injustice, no disease, no exploitation, no COVID-19, no restrictions. No boredom or job loss, no fear, panic or stress. It's a place of joy and laughter, of feasting and wine. It's a place of happiness, friendship, of harmony, satisfaction. It's a place of peace and perfect enjoyment of all good things. Mother Teresa, who lived among the most severe suffering, put it like this. In light of heaven, the worst suffering on earth, a life full of the most atrocious torture on earth, will be seen to be no more serious than one night in an inconvenient hotel. So we get comfort. The cross assures me that I'm not alone or forgotten in this world of suffering. I may not know the answer to why God is allowing this suffering, but I know what the answer is. It, 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 I know what the answer isn't. It's not that God doesn't love me. And we get hope. The resurrection and the afterlife assure me not just of consolation and restoration, but complete satisfaction beyond my wildest dreams. And from comfort and hope, we end up with peace. This is not all pointless. Historically, all other religions located our meaning in life, not within this life, but in something else, in the afterlife. And, and that meant yeah, no matter the religion, they had a way of equipping their members for suffering. Suffering could actually enhance the meaning of your life. It could help you discover a deeper meaning. But our modern secular culture today has become the least able to equip its members to suffer. And why is that? Because they have no resources to draw on. If the meaning of your life is bound up in this, in this life, this 80 years or however long we have, well, then suffering cannot possibly enhance it. It can only take away. So no wonder we panic and we re react in fear and cannot face death and we cannot face more restrictions and more lockdowns because we have no resources to help us. If, in, if your meaning in life is found in wealth, money, success, health, relationships, um, families, 
the environment, social or political causes, whatever it's found in suffering destroys that meaning. It eats away at it. But if your meaning, on the other hand, in life is, is to know and to love and enjoy God now and forever, well, suffering can actually help you with that, as I'm finding in this time. Our modern secular culture is the least equipped to deal with suffering. And whilst we live in extraordinary amounts of comfort compared to the majority of the world, we react with far greater anxiety to suffering than the majority of the world that has so much less than us. You see, as a Christian, I can have peace because I know that in all the chaos, in all the suffering, in all the discomfort, God is somehow working for a greater good and, and it has a purpose. Now think about the cross. At the time where nobody saw anything positive, there was devastation and pain. No one at the time understood how any good could happen. Jesus was dying. The enemies were winning. Hope was over. All was lost. Think about that image that was on the screen earlier. Yet God was doing something marvelous. He was forgiving sins. He was setting in place the restoration of all things and guaranteeing eternal life. That means that your suffering, your loss, your hurt, it's not wasted. It's, it's not meaningless. It's not pointless. If there was no God, it would be. But if there is a God who is both powerful and who can turn the death of his own son into, the, into a greater glory than anyone at the time could ever imagine, then he can do the same with your life, even at the moment you don't really understand. And this is what gives comfort, peace and hope. We have comfort that we're not alone. We have hope that there is a bright future and we have peace that there is a purpose, there is a point, there is a meaning. So the cross does not solve the problem of suffering, but it does supply the essential perspective from which to look at it. The cross does not give my mother the answer to why her sister Rhoda is no longer here with us, but it does assure her that Rhoda's death was not meaningless, but rather eternally meaningful. The cross does not give my mother any more time with her sister, but it does give her the promise of eternity with her. It gives us the resources, only Christianity gives us the resources we need for comfort, hope, and peace in times of suffering. Thank you guys very much for listening.